We'll continue with Unit 7, Natural Selection, of our AP Biology series. And in this video, we're talking about Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium, which is Unit 7.5. Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium is sort of typically one of the hardest parts of AP Biology. But at the basics of it, it's pretty simple. It's kind of the opposite of evolution. If evolution is the change in the genetic makeup of a population over time, what's the opposite? The opposite is staying the same. And that's what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is. It's when the genetic makeup of a population remains unchanged. This is represented here in the beetles staying the same phenotypically, but it's important to understand that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is talking about them staying the same in terms of the allele frequency in the population. So all of the conditions of Hardy-Weinberg are the opposite of the mechanisms of evolution. Hopefully this makes sense, because if we think about the mechanisms that can cause change in a gene pool of the population, that's evolution, so in order to have stability, we have to have the opposite be true. What are those five conditions? The Hardy-Weinberg conditions are no mutations, no gene flow, no natural selection, random mating, and large population. And large population is because that way we avoid genetic drift. These illustrations are from the Amoeba Sisters. They have a great Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium video that I recommend you check out. So let's jump into some Hardy-Weinberg calculations. The Hardy-Weinberg calculations are based on the assumption that all of those Hardy-Weinberg conditions are met, which means that evolution will not occur. In that case, then genotype frequencies and allele frequencies in a population will stay the same. If all the conditions are met, all the Hardy-Weinberg conditions are met, we won't have evolution, which means genotype and alleles stay the same. Now I should point out that one of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium requirements is a large population. In some calculation problems, we're going to kind of ignore that um, and deal with a small population just to make our numbers easier for those calculations. But realize that one of the requirements of Hardy-Weinberg is having a large population. So let's dive into these numbers. If you know the genotype frequencies in a population, you can always calculate the allele frequencies. So in this case, if we count up all of the individual bunnies who have big A, big A, that's 4 out of 25 of them. And then we can count up all of the big A, little a, that's 12 out of the 25. And little a, little a is 9 out of the 25. Because we know all of their genotypes, we can figure out how many big A alleles and how many little a alleles there are in the population. Keep in mind that each individual has two alleles, so that means they're going to be, in a population of 25, a total of 50 alleles we're looking at. Um, eight of those big A alleles are in the homozygous dominant bunnies. So for each of those four homozygous dominant bunnies, we need to count the big A allele twice. We then need to count one big A allele for each of our heterozygous bunnies. We need to do the same kind of thing with the little a allele. We need to count 12 from the heterozygotes, and we need to count our homozygous bunnies twice because they're holding two of those alleles. So in this population, our big A allele uh, frequency is 0.4, and our little a allele frequency is 0.6. Note that in this case, the recessive allele is actually more frequent in the population. That happens. Um, just because an allele is dominant, like big A, does not mean it's more prevalent. So to do calculations, instead of just always using numbers, we have to have a placeholder of variables to do our calculations more easily. So we represent the frequency of the dominant allele with the letter lowercase p. The frequency of the recessive allele is represented by lowercase q. If we know that, if we know that P is the dominant allele frequency and Q is the recessive allele frequency, how could we represent the frequency of the three different genotypes? So those three genotypes are represented by P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared. And the reason that works is because the likelihood of a specific genotype is the likelihood of the two alleles occurring together. So the likelihood of big A, big A is the likelihood of A times the likelihood of A. And representing that with variables, that's P times P, which is P squared. So why is it that the likelihood of big A, little a, is 2PQ? The reason big A, little a, is 2PQ is because there are two ways of getting that. You can have P times Q or Q times P. 
that can be represented in kind of thinking about the population or thinking about um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium allowing us to look at genotype frequencies as sort of a population level Punnett square. So if our frequency of P is 0.4 and our frequency of Q is 0.6, then we would have 0.24 is the likelihood of getting PQ, and the likelihood of getting QP would be also 0.24, which means that um, you add those together because there are kind of two ways of getting that. You can see that in our um, population example here, as there are two rectangles representing that, um, that heterozygous um, possibility. So here we go on to more complicated calculations. What if, what if all we knew were the phenotypes of the individuals and that the population was at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So now let's imagine we don't know the genotypes of these. All we know is that we have some bunnies with brown fur and some bunnies with white fur. We do know that the um, white coat is the recessive, um, the, due to a homozygous recessive, but that's about all we know. Based on that, how many of those values can you determine? We actually can determine all of the values. Let's go through it one at a time. We can determine the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype because all individuals that display the recessive phenotype must be homozygous recessive. So the only way to get a white-coated bunny is to have two copies of that recessive allele. So that means that we know that 9 out of the 25 bunnies must be little a, little a. Um, in terms of a frequency, that's just 9 divided by 25, or 0.36. In Hardy-Weinberg equations, we represent that as Q squared, because that's the likelihood of getting a recessive allele times the likelihood of getting a recessive allele. So that's Q squared. And if you notice, I put a note in the upper left, um, just as another reminder that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium assumes a large population, even though a lot of these calculations are actually done on fairly small populations. So let's go on and see what else we can figure out. Now that we know that Q squared is 0.36, what can we determine next? So determining next is Q. If we know that Q squared is 0.36, that means that Q is 0.6. We calculate that by just taking the square root of both q and its value. Where do we go from here? Well, if we know that there are only two alleles in the population, then if an allele isn't little a, it must be big A. So if the frequency of little a is 0.6, that must mean that the frequency of big A is 0.4. So the way you write that algebraically is p plus q equals 1. So if we know Q, we can calculate P by subtracting from 1. When the population is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the genotype frequencies follow the equation P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. That's because those are all, those are the total possibilities. It's either homozygous dominant, represented by P squared, or heterozygous, represented by 2PQ, or homozygous recessive, represented by Q squared. Since those are all of the possibilities, they add up to 1, because um, in terms of frequency, 1 is 100%. Therefore, if we know those um, equations and we know both values of P and Q, we can calculate P squared and we can calculate 2PQ. So to find P squared, you take the value for P and you square it. To find 2PQ, you take the value of P, multiply it by the value of Q, and multiply it by 2. If we do that in this example, we get 0.16 for p squared, because that's just 0.4 squared, and 2pq is 0.48. That's 0.4 times 0.6 times 2. So now that we know the frequencies, if we also know the population size, we can calculate the frequency of each genotype. In this case, we can calculate that there must be four homozygous dominant bunnies, uh, because we know that that's 0.16 of the population. So the frequency is 0.16 times 4, 25 gives you that value of 4. So 4 out of the 25 must be homozygous dominant. You can do the same thing with the um, heterozygous, is that if you know that that represents 0.48 of the population, take 0.48 times the population size of 25 and we get 12, 12 bunnies.
Because there are twice as many alleles in the population as there are individuals, and that's always true, we then, for um, any population that we know the size of, we also know how many total alleles there are in the population. So in this population of 25, that must mean that there are 50 alleles. If we know how many alleles there are total, and we know the frequency of both of the alleles, we can figure out the total number of each allele. So for example, we know that there are 40% um, big A alleles. That comes from knowing that P is 0.4. So a frequency of 0.4 is equal to 40%. So if there are 50 total alleles, and we know that 40% of them are um, big A, so we take 50 times 0.4, and that gives us 20. So that's how many big A alleles there are. You can do the same thing using Q to find the recessive allele. So in this case, with 50 total alleles times 0.6, which is the frequency of the recessive allele, we multiply 50 times 0.6 and we get 30. That's the total number of little A alleles in the population. Because this is a tough concept, I want to do another practice problem. In this case, it looks like the population is smaller, but we actually have each of these wolf logos represents 100 wolves. Let's take this population that we're visualizing here and assume that the population is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So all five of those requirements have been met. Based on that assumption, see if you can calculate how many wolves are homozygous dominant, have the big G, big G um, alleles. The first step is to calculate how many homozygous recessive individuals we have. The reason we want to focus on those is because we know the genotype of those individuals. The individuals showing the dominant trait, we don't know if those are homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So it's much better to focus, first of all, on those homozygous recessive individuals. In this case, those are the wolves with the galaxy coat. Um, there's one of those shown, which means that represents 100 wolves. So we know that 100 wolves out of a total of 1,600 wolves are little g, little g. That gives us a frequency of 0 0.0625. That's q squared. What we can do now that we have q squared is take the square root to find q. After we find q, we can subtract from 1 and get p. Now that we have both p and q, um, knowing that this population is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can calculate p squared by taking 0.75 times 0.75, and we can calculate 2pq by multiplying 2 times 0.7 times 0.25. To figure out how many of each of these types of wolves we have, we then multiply by the population size. So we take the frequencies and we multiply by 1600. And that gives us that there are 900 wolves expressing the big G, big G um, genotype. You can visualize this, again, if you think about the um, Hardy-Weinberg problem is essentially just looking at, um, it's kind of a population level Punnett square. So if those upper left quadrant, those are all of the wolves that you get from, um, from the combination of two dominant alleles. So if P is 0.75, you take 0.75 times 0.75, that's going to give the frequency of that homozygous dominant genotype. Multiply by the population size, and that gives you the total number of wolves. As a final reminder in this Hardy-Weinberg section, reminder that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium only occurs when all of the Hardy-Weinberg conditions are met. If any one of those conditions are not met, the genotype and allele frequencies can change between the generations. And that's evolution. Remember that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is the opposite of evolution. Evolution is the change in the gene pool over time. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is when there's no change over time. Something also important to point out is that really in real life, there's always change. You can't have an infinitely large population. Um, you can't have, you very, very rarely have complete isolation. Um, you very rarely have cases where all of the traits have exactly the same fitness. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is really important in modeling, in saying, like setting a baseline of if there was no change, what would the population look like over time? And then we can compare real life to that idea, and we can see, uh, get a better idea of what's sort of driving evolution.
That's going to be the end of our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. I really do recommend you practice and practice and practice these problems um, and think through them deeply as you're going so that you really understand the concepts rather than just the steps along the way.